aware of that fact. I'm probably preaching, preaching to the acquire here. But the question is, how do we overcome the barriers to growing sales um, and the things that keep us sales leaders awake at night? So with me to explore just that, we have Luke, Luke Robinson. Say hello, Luke. Oh, hi, guys. Luke is one of Dermland's top, top sales performance consultants and trainers. He's worked with the likes of Sage, PwC, uh, Fujitsu, MBS, Reba, and many, many more. Um, and over the years, he's enabled these organizations to think and act more commercially. We also have Chris Walker. To, to say hi, Chris. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chris is one of our learning and development consultants. He has a passion for all things e-learning and how to use technology and best practice to codify sales success within organizations of all shapes and sizes. And last, but by no means least, we have our special guest, Joe Headley. Joe, say, can, you, can you say hello? Hello, everyone. Wonderful. Uh, Joe is the Deputy Director of Business and Enterprise at Northumbria University. Uh, Joe is very much leading uh, his organization's charge into becoming much more commercial and respond to rapidly changing market con conditions. Um, and the whole purpose of this webinar is to give a candid assessment of the misconceptions that sales teams up and down the, the, the country, and in fact, world, have and that keep their leaders awake at night. Um, and of course, most importantly, uh, some tips on how to overcome them. We're also going to be given some real egg examples of how Joe and his team have done just that. So we encourage you to ask as many questions as you like using the uh, chat box. Please do not be shy. After all, this is your session and um, you guys have obviously tuned in to get as much value as possible. Um, as we say up north, shy Ben's getting out. This webinar should take around um, 30 to 45 minutes, depending on questions. And we will try and answer as many relevant questions throughout as possible um, and have a more in-depth QA at the end, depending on time. Uh, if we run out of time, uh, don't worry because we can always pick up questions afterwards. So like I said before, a sales process is critically important to sales success and the basis for a sales leader's good night's sleep. At Durham Lane, we have what we consider a proven sales process that has been tried and tested by ourselves and our clients of all shapes and sizes for coming up to uh, 10 years now. It's called selling at a high level. It's meant to do what it says on the tin and it essentially breaks down each of the key stages of the sales process to mirror the typical B2B buyer journey. So made up of five phases, um, selling at a high level is a, a value-based consultative customer-centric approach. So if we look at the first phase, find and create, it's all about assessing who to connect with and how, and developing engagement strategies focused on business fit, business value. Um, define and understand is the second phase through a blend of questionings and qualification. It's all about seeking to effectively and efficiently understand the needs of your customers. And then, of course, propose, recommend and present, which is all about making recommendations designed to solve those relevant business issues um, uncovered in early phases and establish um, yourself as a, as a trusted advisor. Close out, which is obviously increasingly important, recognizing when and how to close. So the next step is a natural progression in that conversation and often overlooked, serve and grow. So how to get off to the best possible start um, once a customer has signed off and understanding how success will be delivered and what else can be done to increase your customer's success. Now, this all sounds really simple, right, in theory. But actually what we find is in practice, it can be far from it. And that's often because the sales process is complicated by a series of misconceptions. Luke, you work with all kinds of sales teams and sales leaders every day. Um, in your view, what's the biggest misconception um, that you experience in the find and create sales stage? Yeah, well, certainly in finding create, we always call that the, the wheel of business development. Uh, it should always, always be turning. So it always should be who else, where else, what else, how else, uh, you know, where else can we be helping other customers as well and which other markets will we might be, uh, be able to explore. Uh, and what we find is it's a little bit chicken and egg within organizations. You'll often hear from salespeople that I'm actually too busy selling to find time for prospecting uh, or I don't actually have time for prospecting. Um, 
what I want to say is you think you don't have time, then you have to make time. Okay, because everyone at your company from executives to entry level, uh, entry level SDRs or sales execs should be prospecting. Okay, now as leaders within organizations or as part of a leadership team, it's all about instilling an actual prospecting culture from top to bottom and driving home that absolutely everyone is responsible um, for prospecting and getting and generating new business. In addition to uh, traditional prospecting activities, so telephone and email, a lot of senior sales reps who think that they don't have time to prospect um, should also be prospecting at a different, um, more creative or more public facing ways as well. So they should always be networking, relationship building, attending local, national, or even international industry events, prospecting face to face to help build and promote your brand or your business. It's also important for senior sales rep to be active on social media. So build a Twitter and a LinkedIn presence because social sellers we're finding going forward, certainly into the likes of 2020, um, it's going to work and sh you should be actively doing it. And when I say going into 2020, 85% of the actual um, process will be handed uh, or handled uh, with no human interaction by 2020. So in terms of social selling and what's out there uh, and how accessible you are on social media, uh, it's absolutely key to find it and create a new business. Okay, thank you. That's really interesting. We're seeing constantly this, this debate play out on, ironically, on social media on how social selling and cold calling are almost opposite ends. But essentially what you're saying is it, it matters less about the channel, it's about the activity and not ne neglecting. Yeah. Prospecting. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if we think about the next phase of that, of, of, of that process, defining understanding, um, let's say we generate loads of prospects, um, having loads of great conversations, depending on whatever channel that, that might be. What is the biggest misconception or biggest mistake you see people make in the defining under, understand phase? Yeah, possibly the most important part of any single sales process. Um, sales conversations, but probably the, the biggest misconception is these sales conversations should be quick. Uh, because my customers are busy, they don't have time to be uh, to be speaking to me for all that time and answering all my questions. Or a lot of people actually think, well, I know what it is that my customer needs. Okay, and a lot of salespeople tend to think when they are uh, getting into conversations is, well, what question should we ask in order to find this information out as quickly as possible? My advice there would be to slow it down. Yeah, slow it down uh, because sales mantra number seven here at Darren Lane, there are a number diff uh, of different sales mantras, um, is estimate then validate, never assume, okay? Um, and question-based selling and qualification will always be a sales, uh, a stable part uh, in any single sales process. Um, wherever salespeople um, in the world are now spending 50% of their time on deals that actually won't close. So essentially what that means is, is they're, they're running around kissing frogs uh, or they're chasing, re uh, chasing imaginary revenue based on an exciting conversation that they've had that 50% on, on deals that actually won't close then equates to 3.2 times more time on deals that actually don't close. So an actual qualification process is key to success. Now, our Magic 35 qualification process allows people and individuals uh, or, or organizations, sorry, um, people to spend their time where they can be most effective. Now, I know that we've worked uh, extensively with the team over at Northumbria University, Joe, and I just wonder if you can tell me how much Magic 35 structure helped change the way that your guys had conversations. Yeah, um, it's, it's been, it's changed it an awful lot. I think um, it's taken what was a fairly sort of indistinct process of questioning to make, to give it a, a sort of clear route of information. So the, the, most of the feedback we've had from the team is that, the, you know, they've, they've now got almost a set agenda in no particular order to, to get the information that's required. And I think as you've articulated, it's about spending their time in the right place and it, it becomes much more apparent by collecting that information and analysing it objectively, whether how close a sale, sale is really um, in terms of the, the cycle. And I think that's that's such a key thing because it removes the emotion from it um, once you've got that information, and, it, and it's also a, a sort of a key, the key roadmap of the key information that, that you need, uh, and you you, 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 know, you can 
analyze things retrospectively with that in mind. So it's, it's a big part of what we do and it's um, fully embedded in our language and, and culture now. Brilliant. Thanks, Joe. I think one of the things that I think is quite interesting as well and something to consider is that people almost think qualification, Luke, especially for Magic 35, is, 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 is a one-off. You only have to do it once, but of course it has to be brought in at every stage and to keep on qualifying and keep on understanding if that criteria has changed. Yeah, because there's always more information that you need to be able to find out. Uh, the conversation does not just stop um, from, you know, it doesn't stop at the, from the first conversation. There's always something else that we need to find out. There's always an extra score that you could possibly give in yourself. Uh, and as we say, um, you just don't know everything uh, until you know it. So it's always worth continuing to ask and to continue to explore. Indeed. One of, one of the criteria I find very interesting as well is the idea of competition. And one of our founders, Richard Lane, is quite, um, is quite big on this, which is people assume competition just means external people, but it can also be internal stakeholders as well, can't it? Yeah, so often I'll have conversations with uh, somebody who I've got a good relationship, possibly my sponsor within the organization, to actually really understand what the biggest internal blocker is that I'll actually face going into that organization. Because you might be speaking to uh, somebody, certainly in my position, you might be speaking to or trying to get the, uh, the ear of a sales director who has a background in training and believes that he can do it better than I can. Uh, you might be a software vendor going into an organization, uh, trying to get to an IT director who played a huge part in you know, implementing the process that you're trying to get out. Essentially what you're going in there and doing is calling their baby ugly. Um, <laughs> and a lot of the time, that is the biggest internal block or challenge that you will face when trying to get your services into their organization. And often it's um, a lack of a defined need uh, the current process is okay for now. We've always done it this way. Uh, we'll change when the market changes as well. So they tend to be uh, not just other suppliers, but they'll sometimes be the biggest internal bloggers or competition, which will ha ultimately have a, a big outcome on or, or the or effect on the overall outcome. Thank you, Luke. Um, we're, actually, we're actually getting a couple of questions and, and interest on some of the questions that could perhaps be brought in to qualify due, uh, over that magic 35 but. I'm just conscious of time and we might pick it up at a later webinar. Um, if we just move on then to the, the next phase of the, of the sales process, which is propose, recommend, and present. Yeah, often salespeople will jump straight to this phase. They'll pick up the telephone, add, find, and create, uh, and then get straight into telling everybody how great that they are. Um, everybody likes talking about their product, their service, and their solution. Everyone likes talking about themselves and how great their business is. Um, and some of the biggest misconceptions that we find at this stage is, listen, once the customer understands how good we are, then they'll buy from us. So let me tell them how great we are uh, at every single stage in this conversation. Uh, or proposals are an opportunity to tell the customer how good we are as well. Yeah. Now, this relates back to the last point, to be honest, going back to define and understand. Because as I said, salespeople traditionally spend a lot of their time talking about their product, their service, their solution without actually knowing the usefulness of that particular product, service, or solution to the business of the person that you're speaking to. Sales matter number one, before you ever pick up the telephone or get into a conversation or think about going after an organization, should be, is there a business fit? Can we offer them value? Is there business value? If there is, then we want to close on the desire for our long-term relationship. Now, yes, people do prefer to buy from people who are knowledgeable, okay? They are confident, but what we seem to find is the best salespeople actually understand what it is that the buyer needs or is trying to achieve. Now, we spent a lot of the time in terms of changing the mindset and shifting the mindset with Joe and his team. So, Joe, in terms of that mindset shift, um, you know, what did you see from your team uh, or what diff did you see them do differently uh, following the training program? Yeah, um, I think it's, it's quite, um, it, it's both the team and the organization, so it's, it's, it's really quite interesting. So for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with higher education institutions, um, increasingly we are pushed to being more commercial organizations than we are obviously not as public sector funded as we used to be. Um, so as, as that happens and we go through that process, Becoming more commercial is kind of selling to the world what we're good at because that's how we've typically attracted students in the past and we're really good at doing science or whatever it is. And that mentality went through, has gone through into commercial activities and you'll find that in most higher education uh, organisations. 
that the mindset of solution-based selling is is you know both for the team and the organization is I wouldn't say a revelation, but it has changed the way the university looks at everything really. We're much more demand led and about coming up solutions for for employers. And that's whether it's research or um or, or education such as degree apprenticeships or CPD or whatever it is. Um, and, and the result of that, it's much, much, much more effective. We've got much more long-term relationship with businesses that's, that's based on sort of mutual value rather than a transactional one. And that really, I think, began, began from um, the, the training and sort of the mindset of saying, well, we, we're this huge organization that can actually solve a lot of problems for a lot of businesses. So it's, a, it's almost like an open palette when we talk to a business now. Yeah. Uh, and we push the message home as well. It's first about understand the problem or the challenge in order to then demonstrate that you have the right solution. You wouldn't re write a recommendation paper based on um, something that you didn't know. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah, all about so. changing the way that we uh, ask questions, but also the way that we write proposals in terms of understanding the land as it lies today and how it is or where it is you can take them in the future. You know what it is, guys? It's, it's, it's so true. Um, yeah, I, when I give, give talks and I speak to people about sales, you know, when you ask people if you could use, you know, when you say the word sales, what's the first thing that, that comes to mind? And uh, very rarely is it something good. And what we've just talked about there, it's, it's almost, it sounds like common sense, but yet so many people are, just have this, this misconception, which you rightly pointed, pointed out, Luke. Yeah. You know, we mentioned business, bit, business value, our number one mantra. It's, uh, it's proudly printed and stick on our wall and, uh, and is drilled, drilled into every single person that we uh, employ and, and indeed train. Great, so if we think about, um, I guess that could be the most important part of the sales process, which is close out, closing that business um, after you've done all of the, all of the good work through, through earlier phases. Luke, what's the, what's the biggest misconception here? Um, for me, this is probably the biggest misconception that exists within sales. Uh, everybody seems to think that we have some um, magic trick up our sleeves in terms of how do we get better at closing, or closing is a special skill. Um, uh, and the other big, big uh, misconception is closing comes at the end of the sales process, or closing techniques should be used at the end of the sales process. To be honest, closing does come at the end of the sales process. Yeah, that's how we get our customers. We close them, we sign them up. Um, because it's the natural end to any sales cycle, whether it is closed one or even closed lost. But we run a lot of closing sessions um, with different organizations uh, and membership organizations alike. And a lot of the time for our customers, we always, always take them back to define and understand. Yeah, if you've spent enough time at define and understand, then the closeout should just happen naturally. However, closing needs to happen at every single phase in selling at a higher level sales process. Yeah right from find and create all the way through to serve and grow. Closing doesn't just mean winning business. Closing also means gaining commitment from the customer. You know, gaining a commitment that they're ready to move to the next phase. A lot of the time when you are actually closing individuals or trying to gain commitment from them, you need to be specific about what it is that you're getting the customer to commit to. Because a lot of the time, if a customer is committing to something with a salesperson, they think, oh my God, I'm signing up. Uh, money needs to change hands. I've committed to something that I shouldn't have. Be specific about what it is that you want them to commit to, but also be realistic uh, or realistic as to where you ask it in the conversation. Closing is simply about asking for the business, but knowing how and where to do it in the conversation. So again, just going to chime Joe back in as well. I'm really interested just to find out a little bit more about how we've managed to actually remove the mystery uh, of closing uh, within your organization. Yeah, I think I think you kind of already touched on it, to be honest, Luke. It's, it's the closing out at each stage was such a big thing for us. And I think um, it's exactly as you said, uh, I think the preconception in our organization was that it happens at the end. And that was a very transactional way of looking at it. And I think just to touch on your sort of earlier point, it is a cycle that goes round and round and round to a certain extent. When, and, and you choose the right time based on the information that you've got, whether that be the magic 35 or the other methods and techniques that we were given through the training. Um, you know, it, it allows you to sort of judge that moment at the right time. But I think the big, um, the big piece for us was closing at each stage and that whole principle and 
how we can now sort of track that through our CRM and 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 you know monitor that and and, and know when the right time and the, and the right buttons to press to actually progress the sale. I think was probably the biggest thing for us. How much of a, a positive effect has that had on your actual results so far? Um, I think quite well this year we've, uh, without going into too much detail, we've uh, grossly exceeded all our targets. Um, and, you know, I think in a large part of that, that's the influence of the training that we've spent a lot of time uh, doing. Uh, I think the, the big thing, though, from, from, from a culture point of view, which is perhaps more important from my point of view, uh, is that um, that urgency to sell it, it is kind of there but there's a larger understanding that it's a process and there's confidence in the process and you can't you can't force it and i think that's probably the, the biggest thing this year and i think that has led to the the, the results not only have we sort of exceeded target but i think they're much more longer term relationships that, that will continue to to go around the uh, the circle or the wheel or i forgot what you referred to it as <laughs> perfect Great, thank you for that, Joe. Um, and I think this is a really interesting the next part of what we want to talk about here, which is the idea of serving and growing. Um, <laughs> the the sales process um, can often be seen as almost quite linear, and the reason why we've structured our selling at a high level uh, graphic here is 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 um, is in a circular uh, graphic is to make that point that it's an ongoing process. Um, Luke, just before I come on to you to get your thoughts on this, um, I wanted to share a slide um, which I saw from HubSpot. Um, everyone's probably aware of HubSpot, um, real leaders when it comes to inbound marketing. And they've coined this idea of moving from a funnel to a flywheel. Everyone knows the idea of a, of a sales funnel and people use it all the time, right? Marketing or prospecting or however, um, you know, stuffs loads of leads at the top of the funnel, we're gonna lose some throughout the process. We're gonna then sell them. A customer drops out the bottom and then job done, right? Onto the, onto the next one. Whereas um, we've seen a real paradigm shift in the last few years, especially in the B2B space of customers being at the center of everything we do from a marketing, sales and customer service point of view. All of these functions working hand in hand in order to um, drive value throughout the sales process, not just at the first order. So, Luke, thinking about what we would call serve and grow in our selling at a, at a high level process, um, what, what, what do you see as, as the biggest issue that keeps sales, sales leaders awake at night? Um, well, salespeople are brilliant, or certainly new business salespeople are brilliant at chasing. They'll chase and chase and chase and chase until they've got the signature pass it over, out of sight, out of mind, yeah. Uh, it's now a customer service or customer success issue. Um, and typically, well, the sale process ends when the business is closed for me. I'll just pass it over to the actual team that deals or the delivery team as well. Now, we firmly believe that no matter what number you have on your back within your organization, you are always part of the sales process. Whether it's your sales, your technical guys, your delivery or your customer success team, Whatever you do, your activity plugs into the overall customer experience as to what Sean was alluding to on there as well. Um, we often hear the phrase, I'm an account manager, not a salesperson. Uh, I'm a farmer, I'm not a hunter, right? You're a salesperson and you are customer facing. You deal with customers and you develop accounts. So even as an account manager, you need to land and expand with the particular customer that you've got. Um, identify value added projects continually throughout, um, throughout um, the, the term of them being a customer. Um, and do that within all of your customer base. Now, we found that the cost of winning new business is actually higher than you think. So short term, customer retention is almost always a more profitable activity than winning new business. So in terms of that mindset and that approach, Joe, because I know that we, we work with a lot of your BDMs and account managers, how did this way of thinking help yourself, your team and ultimately your customers? Uh, caused us a great deal of stress. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, because I think um, it it helped us. So our team is is and still is the sort of main commercial facing team of the university. Um, so so getting involved in sort of more operational things and service things was was something that they always did to try and make sure that the customer had the right customer experience or the business, and. That, that was often not really seen as part of their job. 
um, both by themselves and the organization. And I think that's, that's changed significantly that removed a lot of angst and, and actually made a lot of non-commercial aspects of the, the organization think more commercially because of that influence. Um, I think to, to sort of draw that, you know, to epitomize that, we, we as most uh, universities, we have sort of a strategy and, and, and business outcomes. As they and uh, one of the business outcomes that was aligned to our service was to be uh, much more commercially faced. And there's various APIs that go with it. That business outcomes actually just been changed to encompass the entire university. And I think that's that's such a such a big thing in terms of how not just the thinking in the team, but the thinking across the university has been influenced by the, the fact that the sales process is, you know, all encompassing. It's not just um, down to one department. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of what we found as well, typically when we work with organizations, um, we always speak to the, the management side of the business who have a preconception of what it is that their salespeople need. Um, and they also hear the misconceptions that are coming out of their salespeople's mouths. Uh, but what we're often finding in the success that we're having going forward in terms of being able to positively change people's organizations and the way or e even their sales processes is actually understand, yes, from a management and leadership level, what is it that your sales team need to improve on, but also actually speaking to the sales people and the sales teams to understand in terms of, listen, what is it that you need? Yeah, what skills do you need to then get better at? Uh, where do you lack? Where do you, what can you continually do better? So in terms of understanding the full commercial outfit, that is where we're really going to be looking and aiming for going forward. Yeah, thank you for, for that, Luke. And I think that's a, a really good segue into um, one of our new offers that we have recently introduced. Um, essentially, it's all about understanding what the actual training needs of the organization are. Um, so I think Chris is probably best placed to shed a little bit of light on how that might work. Yeah. <clears throat> Afternoon, everyone. So. As Sean and Luke have discussed, we, we, we use Sant at a higher level um, because it is the natural process for a sales cycle within customers, commercially, you name it, and it goes through the same cycle no matter what you look to sell, what you're looking to buy. Now, when we speak to a lot of businesses, what happens is that, like Luke said, we speak to leaders and management and they tell us, look, we want to close more deals, we want to do this, we want to do that, and that's all great. But what we find is that when we have a discussion, we find that misconceptions live within the earlier stages. So like we've gone through a day within finding, create, define, understand, and so on and so forth. So what we've designed is a training needs analysis that will look to identify what misconceptions live and breathe within your organization. If we understand these misconceptions, then the training programs that are designed through Durham Lane are specifically designed to combat these misconceptions. So what we want to do is we want to put that out to you guys that are on this webinar if you believe that there are some misconceptions or if you can relate to any of these or if you think there is more within your organization and you want to do something about it, we put it to you that a, train, a training needs analysis is going to give you all that information. So what we're willing to do is commercially we sell these training needs analysis to organizations that we're in, in discussion with. We're looking to give you guys the option of a discounted rate to one of these training needs analysis uh, where we give you that, that feedback, we tell you what's going on uh, and, and potentially have a further conversation around other things that we can do, can do for you as well. So what we'll do is we'll send some information um, around that to myself and the team. We'll put something together and get back in touch with you as, at a later date. Great. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, I think that's a very um, important thing to talk about. Now, we've got a couple of questions um, which, which we now want to address. And uh, yes, someone has mentioned the B word. Um, what will Brexit mean for the future if they're selling at a high level? Um, oh God, where to start with this one? Um, well, it's actually really quite interesting. So I was at a um, seminar last week on, uh, that was paid for by the uh, government and um, actually did make Makes sense. Essentially, guys, the main thing to know and what is looking like the overwhelmingly likelihood is that um, we will continue in this um, period of um, hassle for the next 15 years. 
um, the spokesperson for the government said, look, it's, it's increasingly likely that it's going to be business as usual were, the word, were his words. And we were made full EU members until 2034 or five. Uh, it took Canada seven years to negotiate 5% of what we would need to negotiate with the EU. So the main message, I guess, is that unless you want to wait 15 years to invest in sales growth or whatever you might be looking to do, do not use that as a decision to defer. Um, okay, I think that's enough said on that. Um, I didn't even manage to talk about Boris Johnson, which is, which is, which is great. <laughs> Moving swiftly onwards. Um, and I guess this is, this is um, well, I understand this question, but I was actually going to ask this question to the audience, which is thinking about sales and marketing and this idea of the flywheel. If you could almost put yourself behind a veil of ignorance and think about a modern B2B organization, would you have sales and marketing as two different functions? And I've asked this a couple of different times. I know Luke has a couple of interesting thoughts on this as well. But overwhelmingly, the answer tends to be no because they're both driving towards generating the same outcome, which is ultimately ROI, close one customers. Um, and if they're not, then why the hell are we doing it? <laughs> um, we've also have a question here, which is essentially, how do you work out the cost of a sale? Um, and um, the kind of second part of that is, you know, how do you work out the cost of new business, um, which, uh, I think sort of reading between the lines, it's almost how do you work out ROI and how do you ensure that you get um, to essentially still make profit, which is really ironic question because if we think about everything we spoke about in this webinar, a lot of time can be wasted on the sales process because of these misconceptions. Ultimately, everyone's cost has a time. This isn't, <laughs> sometimes isn't factored into a cost of acquisition. So if you can streamline that process and spend less time and I think, phrase Luke used, which certainly resonates with everyone here at Durham Lane, is spend time where you can be most effective. Um, clearly, that will drive down the cost of acquisition. We can maybe speak um, a little bit in more detail as to um, the specifics and what that might look like in um, this person's particular individual case. But from my point of view, it's, it's uh, you know, I'm the, the marketing guy in a, in a sales company. So you can imagine I'm under a lot of scrutiny for ROI. It's all about understanding what is the actual cost of ownership of time, materials, travel, et cetera, as a ratio to uh, closed one revenue. Um, I hope that answers that person's question. Um, do we have any more coming, coming through there, Charlotte? Okay, I think we've stunned everyone into silence. Um, just Joe, reflecting on everything that we've spoken about, and thank you, by the way, I think it's been a very useful session and thank you very much for joining us. Do you have any parting thoughts or final thoughts before we bring this webinar to a close? Um, well, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, I, think, I think the one thing that I always try to say whenever I talk about Durham Lane is from our point of view, I think in, in higher education, so you know, commercialization has all has always been the little little brother, as it were. It's always been research and teaching, and it's become increasingly important. So, um, the idea of sales, adding you know beyond commercialization in terms of language, is is often um, for the academics very difficult for people to to swallow, and it, and it does because, as you said at the the, the beginning, it, you know, sales has a, a connotation associated with it, and I think with that in mind. For us, the, the, the solution-based cell and the various techniques and the professionalised approach that, that we now use, probably, well, in a large part, down to Durham Lane's training, has, has given us a huge amount of credibility within the organisation for a job that I think we've done without the, for, for quite a long time, but without that sort of, without the clear methodology and process. And I think that's changed not only our team's approach to it and how they feel valued by the organization, but also how the organization values not only the, 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 the benefit that, that we bring, but also the level of expertise and um, thought and, and, and effort that goes into to making it actually happen. And I think that that is a big, a big shift for, for, for our sales team in terms of being more effective in the field, but also being more effective in terms of driving that service delivery and, and that realization of the customer relationship being everybody's responsibility across the organization. Yeah. And I think that 
that is the biggest thing that I think is, is you know, benefits for us. Great. Thank you for that, Joe. I think that, is, uh, that, that was absolutely a great point on which to bring proceedings to a close. So thank you very much for everyone's time. Um, I hope you found that useful. We will, of course, be sending the recording round to um, everyone who has signed up and attended, um, as well as answering any specific questions that we didn't get time to or that come to you perhaps um, after we draw the webinar to a close. We're going to try and make this more regular moving forward. Um, so if you have any specific questions or topics you would like us to discuss, um, please do let us know and we will try and factor them into uh, future plans. So on that note, uh, thank you very much for everyone's time uh, and we will um, bring the webinar to a close. Thank you.